Hi, guys. Welcome to the How I Raise It podcast, the show where you get an inside, unfiltered look at how real entrepreneurs raise capital for their businesses. I'm your host, Nathan Beckard, and today's episode is with Ava Dobranska of True Altitude, a company that helps companies raise capital and grow their businesses. She shares her advice for the fundraising process, uh, for sourcing investors. She shares tips for maintaining a dialogue with investors. She shares pitching tips and much more. If you're tuning into this podcast to learn how to raise capital for your business, I have a super valuable free welcome package for you. It includes a list of 2,500 investors who don't require a warm intro, plus 200 questions that investors are going to ask you. So it's really going to help you get ready to raise capital. To get instant access to this, click the link in the first comment. While you're there, please leave us a nice comment, what you like about this series or this episode in particular. Last but not least, if you enjoy this conversation and think someone else would too, Please share it with them. Hit that subscribe button to get all our latest episodes. Now, thank you. Sit back and enjoy this chat with Ava. Welcome to How I Raised It, the podcast that goes behind the scenes with entrepreneurs who've raised capital. We uncover the tips, tricks, and techniques they use to get investors to write a check. Strap in and turn it up. Hi, welcome to another episode of How I Raised It, produced by Foundersuite.com. Today, I have Ava Dobranska of True Altitude coming to us from London. How's your day going? Really good. Thank you, Nathan. How are you? I'm good. It's a beautiful day here in, in San Francisco, so all good. Um, awesome. Well, let's jump right into it. What is True Altitude? Right. So we are now officially an Abu Dhabi headquartered investment firm and advisory. Uh, we're working both with the early stages and soon with the later stages as well, as we are in the process of launching a fund. Um, I am on in the advisory arm of the business. So that means I get to work with the early stage startups, uh, normally pre-seed through to series A, with our sweet spot being B2B SaaS, tech-enabled companies, experienced founders. Um, and essentially what we help them to do is to grow through strategic advice, um, helping to connect with the right investors and overall strategizing the capital raise in a way that supports the business model that they've got. Um, it, in a way that also supports the problem that they are addressing and overall just to make sure that they are doing it faster, better, and in a more efficient way. Sure, sure. Good. You said pre-seed up through what? What's your sort of sweet spot for clients? Uh, pre-seed through to Series A. So most of the companies that we're currently working with, they are raising their seed raise, maybe Series A as well. Um, and yeah, so what we can help them do is to not only to make sure that the strategy behind the race is right, but also to accelerate with, you know, how fast they can connect with investors, how fast that they're getting the meetings, et cetera. Okay, cool. Are you working with solely European startups? You mentioned also being headquartered in Abu Dhabi. Why there? What's the connection yeah. there? Um, so yeah. Uh, we're global. We're working with founders globally. We've got offices in London, Sydney, now Abu Dhabi as well, Dubai. Um, so the reason why we are now, we now have presence in the GCC region is that the larger growth fund that we are in the process of launching will be out of Abu Dhabi. Um, so this will be supporting the later growth stages, uh, Series C and beyond, whereas the advisory will continue to work with the early stage businesses um and yeah geography wise we are free to work with startups anywhere in the world um i think our biggest proportion of the founders that we're working with would be uk and europe naturally um and then australia as well as earlier this year we have merged with an australian investment firm so it has been definitely a period of rapid growth we've gone from a team of about 12 to 34 globally now mm -hmm. um new hires and you know everything happening so it's been an exciting time very cool what so what's the process like a startup comes to you and you know, wants to raise capital. 
yeah. what do you do? Like what take me step by step what you guys do. Yeah, like. yeah. So I'll give you an example. One of the clients that we were working with, well, firstly, they wanted to know exactly how much they should raise. Um, so we were able to work with them through their current burn rate, what they had, and the number of months that they needed to fund the company for to get to their next meaningful milestones. And that was part of the capital raising strategy session that um, we were running for them. So we've agreed in the end on the raising amount, uh, the valuation, looking at the current market trends, use of funds, et cetera. Um, the next step in the process with us for that client was that I was designing their pitch deck. Um, this is something that I was doing before when I was running my own company. So I would be working with founders, helping them to design or redesign pitch decks. Um, so we've got the pitch deck made investment teaser, which is essentially the resume of your pitch deck. That's what I say, two pages max. Um, and then we would create a curated list of investors to go after. This is typically anywhere between 80 to 140 of VC funds that we start to target, but then the list grows. And then we go out there and basically reach out to, to the investors pitching the company, speaking about the company, seeing where the fit is and um, maintaining the dialogue as well with the funds, which I think the last part, this is what I found crucial um, in getting that first check because we've literally had situations where, you know, we wouldn't be getting any replies from the investors at all. And then only on the third or the fourth or even a fifth follow-up when we were able to say, oh, this has happened. And then 10 minutes later, the investor gets back to us, get me in for a meeting. Um, so yeah, so that ongoing communication, we're, we're basically like the extended investor relations team to the founder for a very highly engaged period of like three months, six months, however long the race is going for. Very interesting. All right, I'm going to kind of pick apart each of those yeah. steps and, and you know talk about it a little bit. Um, Let's start with building that list of investors. So what, uh, how do you do that? How do you, what are you using? Uh, you already have uh, investor contacts in your own network or database or what's, what's that process look like? Yeah, so we've got our, you know, you could say a black book of contacts. We've got our database and network of investors with whom we've been building relationships over the years. Um, and we are also uh, in, you know, like, regular cadence calls with them, touching up, touching base, because I think what's important to note is that it's not just the VC funds investment thesis that they've got, but you also should know whether they have dry powder. Um, you also should know what was the most recent investment they made. Because, you know, if, if you're a sustainable fintech business um, and you are reaching out to a VC who has just made an investment in a sustainable fintech business, um, chances are they're not going to go ahead with you because they already invested in your somewhat a competitor, maybe. Mm -hmm. um, so what we're doing uh, is that we are constantly maintaining the existing investor relationships that we've got and building new ones to make sure that at any point in time, we have the most accurate and up-to-date database of investors and we know what they're looking for at the moment like this quarter yeah that's good yeah, yeah, yeah. do you find that investors are eager to work with you because a lot of and maybe this is a u.s versus europe thing but a lot of u.s vcs don't want a middleman or intermediary mm -hmm. right like yeah. what's the what's the reaction you get um i think generally positive i would say um, a lot of it comes down to personal preference as well. That's what I found. Um, for me, what I can definitely say is that once we've talked with the VC, once we've fed them a couple of deals and they see that, okay, the deals coming from us are targeted, uh, you know, like well-placed and up to date, then they generally love this, you know, deal flow sharing relationship because it just makes their lives easier. Um, if we can, you know, um, help our clients and, and help them as a fund as well. That always works well. Um, but yeah, I do agree with you. I know that not everyone is um, that keen to work with middlemen and some people need a little bit more of warming up. But, you know, those who do, they do. And I think there's great value in it. Yeah, interesting. Um, I, I actually had a business somewhat similar to that before starting Founder Suite out oh, here right. in, 
in the US called Venture Archetypes. So we, we were not a broker dealer or intermediary per se, but kind of a fractional consultant doing a lot of the same stuff. So it's curious, yeah. but this is this is over almost 10 years ago. So it's interesting how it's wow. also changed, right? Yeah, it's a different world different these days. Like that. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, very good. Now, in terms of outreach, so you curate this list of 80 to 140 investors to start with. Yeah. Um, and then what's the outreach like? Is it is it just do you do cold drips uh, email sequences to all these, or is there some other method? How well, yeah, talk about the outreach. Mm, so we never automate any of our emails. We don't use any of the automating softwares. We do everything manually, um, and it depends if it is an investor that we already have a relationship with, or if it's someone that that we're trying to reach for the first time. If we're trying to reach them for the first time, then then yes, the first point of contact would be a cold email usually. Um, but then with those whom I've built up relationships already, that really depends. So I, to some investors, I speak on LinkedIn to some emails. With some others, I have quarterly update calls. Um, with some others, I've got their WhatsApps. So it all depends hmm. on the relationship built up. But definitely, when it comes to our goal is to prioritize the relationship-based um, connections where, where yeah, we can literally pick up a phone and say, oh, here's another one for you. Look what we got, you know, this time. Okay, two questions. I guess, what, or why don't you do any automation? It seems like that would make your life easier. Is it just to maintain that sort of personal touch or something? Absolutely. Else? Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah, yeah. It's it's because I think for me, um, it's very rare that I send a cold email that is similar to another one that I would send two similar ones. So with every single one of them, I personalize them. And just whenever I reach out to an investor, there is a specific reason why I want to speak to them. And let's say maybe not to another partner from the firm um, and why the timing is right to speak to them right now. So I think it's definitely much more time consuming, but the results that it yielded for us speak for themselves. So it's it's absolutely worth it. Yeah, I, it's funny. I have a there's reasons I'm asking this too because I, yeah. I think about this a lot. Like we built a an email follow up tool within Founder Suite that lets you email multiple yeah. investors at once, and each email goes out individually from your personal account, <laughs> and soon we're adding like personalization tags like a bunch of different personalization tags so you can really customize each email yeah, even though yeah, you're yeah. sending 50 but i also so we're doing like we're getting into like automation building tools for that but i do think investors can often smell or see through yeah. anything that's yeah. too automated right so there's this like fine line between yeah, yeah. Yeah. So see, this there's this one trick that i really like um when they reply to you for the first time and then you reply back to them. I always try and match the tone. You know, mm. some people, yeah, some people, they do, do this really formal emails when they say, you know, like, hi, name and paragraphs and everything. And others, there will be just one line answer. Sure. So you want to be able to match, match their energy, so to say. Uh, but I think, honestly, the devil's in the details. Mm-hmm. But when you when you play that game right, it's it's honestly, it's astounding how much results more you can get. Good stuff. And you talked about kind of maintaining the dialogue yeah. over the course. So talk about that, like, I guess, and is that mostly like an investor hasn't re- responded to you? So you're just continuing yeah. to send follow-ups or what? Yeah. yeah, yeah. So that's huge. And there's actually this recent example of, so I was, um, I, we were helping one of our clients to, to raise funds and we got in touch with the fund that was a perfect fit, um, share the pitch deck with them, share the financials. They, they said, thank you. We will review. We will get back to you. We haven't f- heard from them for like a week or two, sent a generic follow-up that didn't work. But then the next day after our, our follow-up, the founder informed us that they just hit a major milestone, huge financial results. And b- what I thought is that, oh, I obviously want to communicate it to the investors straight away. So even though there was only one day after my last follow-up, I just went straight ahead and emailed them. By the way, as an update to my previous email, I've just heard back from the founder. This is what they achieved, you know, number, 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 number. And um, 10 minutes later, we got an email back, get me in for a meeting. So that was fantastic. And, and, and that's, that's, that's the kind of a dialogue and natural progression of events that, that you want to achieve. Mm-hmm. Right. Yeah. And 
I guess the a lesson there also is even if they aren't responding, they might still be listening or at least like passively yeah. following along a little bit, right? Hundred percent. Yeah. 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 Hundred percent. And I always say that about uh LinkedIn presence as well, because I'm quite active on LinkedIn and the number of times that I jumped on a call with a founder or with an investor and they would tell me, oh yeah, I always see your name pop up. I always see your, your LinkedIn profile pop up. So you want to be able to create that presence and be on top of their minds um, just ever so slightly. So to, to every founder, I also say, if you can ensure you've got the right presence online, be that LinkedIn, Twitter, Reddit, anywhere where your customers are and then potential investors as well, ideally, um, you should do that because it helps in a lot of ways that we do not notice, but they stack up. Mm, interesting. I want to stick on the maintaining the dialogue just for one more yeah, minute. Yeah, yeah. You know, what are some good follow-up uh, tactics, right? Like what... You send an email out with your pitch deck or your your intro, whatever it may be, and maybe that you're not hearing back. What are some good ways to follow up without obviously being a total pest? <laughs> mm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, one that I can think of that I've not heard, you know, that advice being given out anywhere else is that I always make sure to um, follow the VC and see what other companies are joining their portfolio. Um, because, for example, if you, if, if you can see that, oh, they've just invested in that company, and if you can spot a way that you could help this company, or maybe your products are complementary, or maybe you could become partners in the future, that's what you should say in a follow-up email. I've just seen that you guys invested in this company. We are actually building a similar product that could open up a new delivery channel for, for them, et cetera. Would, would it be now on your radar to restart a conversation? Because I think what it shows is that you you know what's happening for the VC. Um, and also, you know, VCs make introductions for their portfolio companies. So this is basically, again, making their lives easier by doing their job for them. Yeah, that's good. I like that. Um, anything else? I mean, you gave the example of reporting a huge milestone that yeah. triggered one. Any, anything else that you find are good triggers in when doing follow-up emails? Um, yeah, so another thing that I always tell founders is that in your fundraise, you have to be able to create a feeling that the train is leaving the station. Sure. So if you expect that a period of really fast growth will take place in, let's say, in a week's time or in a month's time or next quarter, if you can communicate that to the investor, that's a really good time for a follow-up because what you're basically saying to them is, you know, get in now whilst we're still at the same price. And this is what will happen next month. Like, let's say, oh, we're, we're launching next month or we're going to onboard a new distribution partner that unlocks a pipeline of $20 million worth of clients. Um, so the investors want to get in before they want to invest at the beginning of the exponential curve. That's what I say um, before the major growth happens. So if you offer them that opportunity, I think that's one of the follow-up emails that is always most appreciated. Yep. Good. Yeah. Okay. A couple more quickies and then I want to shift gears a little bit, sure. but um, you know, if you're building relationships with investors such that they will be eager to take your calls and, and get your deals, you must, I'm assuming you you don't take any startup that comes in the door. You must pretty be pretty picky and choosy and selective and what types of startups, right? Or how do you kind of filter who to work with? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So uh, we do have um, we do have a number of industries that, where we can add most value because we're not just a platform for making the introductions we are a strategic advisor so it's not just investor introductions it's also if we can introduce them to potential clients partners or add a value through any other advice on corporate development strategy etc we've taken board seats in the past as well so the sweet spots for us is logistics and supply chain e-commerce and fintech and this basically has to do with the previous experience of our co-founding partners who had been running a logistics, um, sorry, a multi-carrier logistics company before, which they then exited. 
2017. So they're both exited founders. They've got the experience in the space. They've got the right contacts. So we want to be able to maximize the value add that we can provide for the client. So yes, there is a process that we follow in selecting who we work with. So we, re we do review the pitch decks similarly to a way that a VC would. Um, we jump on the first pitch call with the founder as well, ask any follow-up questions, review their DZ rooms, um, and then basically assess whether, um, whether we can help with advice. And then on the investor side, whether our current makeup of, of, the, of the investor database fits what they're looking for as well. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay, last question about your business. What mm -hmm. is the business model? Um, how do you guys charge or make money? Yeah, so there's two modes of engagement that a founder can work with us. There's a focused mode, which is a paid retainer upfront and then a success fee. And the less engaged model, which is just ad hoc introductions, uh, that is purely a success fee only. Um, so again, it depends on the level of help that they need uh, and also the, the, different, the different goals that they're looking to achieve. One of the founders that we were speaking to, they, for example, needed the pitch deck redesigned. Um, they wanted some help with valuation as well. So that naturally calls for the more engaged model where we have weekly strategy calls. Um, they get, you know, access to our team basically 24 7 any questions that they have we work here to help um yeah so just depending on the founder's needs what if you're able to share and you can skip this question now but what is a typical success fee is it a percent like a five yeah percent? so that will be a percentage yeah typically five percent um there is flexibility around that as well depending on a case-by-case -case basis got it cool yeah. okay let's shift gears a bit what so yeah, let's talk about this market. This is an interesting yeah. time. We're recording this end of August. Um, I mean, we're I'm seeing it even with our customers on Fenner Suite. Like it's been pretty good, even all this yeah. talk of recession, but now things feel a little shakier. What are you seeing, feeling? Uh, you know, give us a feel like hands-on of the market right now. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So well, yeah, there is talks of, you know the recession and the down market. I think for me, what's happening, I think it is a market correction rather than a full-blown recession looming and, and a down market. And investors are still investing. However, the investment decisions are just taking a little bit longer. Due diligence process takes a little bit longer too. Because um, honestly, you, you know, you always like, what I always say to founders is that some of the best startups emerged from the down markets and the mm -hmm. crisis in the past. We've we've had, you know, Cisco started after the crash in 1987, um, Google and PayPal after the dot-com burst. Then 2008, you've got Airbnb, WhatsApp, Slack, Uber, um, and yeah, DoorDash in 2020 after, during the health pandemic. So investors still have dry powder and actually i think i posted about this some weeks ago that there has been a record level of vc money raised this year um so investors definitely have plenty of dry powder it's just the fact that they are a bit more selective uh in who they pick to invest it in so yeah that makes sense i think you know, are you advising startups if they don't have to raise money now? Is it a good time to go out and raise money? Or, you know, are the ones we're seeing go out raising now are the ones that have to raise or they're out of money? Mm. Like, what's, yeah, what do you think? Yeah, so objectively, it is a challenging time to raise mm. money compared to the record levels of 2021. Yeah, it is a bit harder. Um, if you can raise money and that. Uh, time as it is now, amazing. That's basically proving all the worth of your business that you might want to have. However, if you can extend your runway, maybe opt in for a couple of non-dilutive funding options to to wait a little bit more, then I've seen a lot of startups doing that and, and it's a good time to do that. That's interesting. In non-dilutive, are you talking about like Revenue-based, uh, kind of a loan, loan type. Yeah, for example, yeah. So you've got you've got venture debt. 
Uh, there's a range of grants and loans for businesses, R&D tax credits as well. Um, I don't know about them in the US, but in Australia and in the UK, if you are a loss making company, you get back these credits as cash back into the business. So that always helps. Um, and then I think if you can accelerate your path to profitability as quickly as possible and make sure that you are actually monetizing on, on your client base, that is fantastic. And then once you actually go out there and raise money, you can say we're revenue generating and that generally puts you ahead of so much competition. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Do you guys help companies in Europe like cross over and raise money from US investors or is it fairly siloed? You know what I'm saying? Um, so not specifically to US. However, for example, what we help companies do is to set up the UK office and we help companies from overseas raise money from the UK investors. So the UK has a really favorable um climate for for investors in the sense that we've got the SEIS and EIS tax reliefs available to investors. So if they invest in early stage startups who are qualified for these tax reliefs, the investor can access 50% or 30% back uh, of, of their money back from the investment. So that significantly de-risks the investment. So what we've been helping uh, overseas startups to do is to apply for these schemes. Um, and then also uh, we represent them here in the UK. Mm, okay. Yeah. So previously you were doing some pitch deck work. What are your best tips for founders for telling a good story or creating a good pitch? So, yeah. Um, so on average, an average VC investor, they will be analyzing your pitch deck for about three minutes and 44 seconds. Um, it's funny, whenever I go on DocSend and I read through the pitch decks, I'm actually within that time frame without even trying. So it must be true. Um, and also what I always say that the golden rule that I always stick to is to have only three key ideas per slide. Because if you've got three, you know, three bullet points, three images, three key messages that you want to include you know if you've got 10 slides three times 10 uh you know like that's already like so many points for an investor to consider and to remember at the end of your pitch mm -hmm. so i think that's that's definitely important and there's um a general template of the pitch deck of the things that i want to see as well so what i don't like is if the pitch deck goes on into so much detail about the product or the tech and how it works. And, you know, like to me, that's cool. I want to know what the product is, but then show me the results. So, so show me the traction, show me your go to market, show me where the people interested in that product are. So this comes down to the difference that a pitch deck is not a sales deck. Um, so it's not just the product that you should devote most of your slides to. It's, it's actually the team, traction and milestones, future roadmap, um, the ask, use of funds, et cetera, competition as well, super important. So, yeah. Yeah, that's good. How many um, companies do you work with at a given time? Like how many deals can you be running at once? I'm just curious. Uh, yeah, so the, the focused ones, um, I would say up to five in a given month. Um, whereas the ad hoc engagements, uh, we now have about 50. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Got it. I'm jumping all over, but I'll just throw a couple other questions out. Like what are some, you know, I think you had something on, on LinkedIn about like SaaS metrics or even just general metrics mm -hmm. that um, you know, maybe you advise your clients like, Hey, if you're raising, if you're going out to raise series A, you yeah. You need X, Y, Z, so on and so forth. Yeah. 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 So uh, I always like whenever founders include what's their margin in their financials. Also, whenever a founder states how many users they have, the natural question that follows from me is how many of them are active. So that's a good metric to include. What's the percentage of your active users versus inactive? Um, customer retention. 
very important. I always like to see it in pitch decks. Um, and then also net dollar retention. If you can showcase high net dollar retention, you're doing great. Um, so I think, yeah, it's, it's just um, getting down to these metrics that showcase that not only you have clients, but you have clients that are paying and that are staying mm-hmm. with your product. Cause, cause yeah, cause, cause that really shows that you're onto something. Cause you know, how many apps from app store have you downloaded and then deleted after two days? Right. Just, just, just to see them, check them out. And I was like, Oh, I don't like it. Or I've downloaded some apps that I've never opened in my life. So yeah, that to me is important. Good, good. All right, I think we've covered a lot. What other, what are your other just favorite tips uh, or tactics that you like to give founders about raising capital that we haven't covered? Have we, or have we covered it all? Anything we're missing? Um, I'm trying to think. I think on the pitching side. Um, so what I always advise my clients is that whenever they go into a meeting with with an investor, um, I tell them not to read out stuff from their pitch deck especially if they shared the pitch deck beforehand with the VC investor, a good idea might actually be to not to use this pitch at all and just have a conversation or show an alternative pitch deck, which shows purely the most recent traction. Um, Because what I always say is that the first meeting with the investor, whether it's face-to-face or whether it's remote, but it should be about relationship building um, rather than repeating what was already said in a pitch. Um, and then another thing it would be to, like what, what I sometimes say is that the best time to start raising is yesterday, mm-hmm. which means that you should always be building the relationships with potential investors, even if you are not actively fundraising at the moment. So, you know, always be fundraising because the point that you want to get to is that you will be going on about your daily business, you know, getting clients, getting traction, etc. And then one of the investors from your network will approach you and will offer you a check, even if you're not raising capital. Um, and that comes from... Um, just engaging with uh, investors, going out there for industry events, um, sometimes jumping on conversations or being introduced to investors, even if you're not raising, but just to let them know, hey, this is what we're doing. We're not seeking capital right now, but we've seen that some of your portfolio companies are similar. So we thought to let you know about what we do as well. Yeah, cool. Good stuff. Always be building relationships. I've heard Heard that from a lot of founders. I very much agree with it. Um, Yeah, I always tell founders to start like six to 12 months in advance. And, you know, just put them on your company update list. So they're getting like a monthly update about what your your progress is like. You don't pitch them. Just ask them for permission to add them to your company list, right? Company update list. Yeah, 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 absolutely. Anything else? Any other just general advice you like to give founders? It doesn't have to be about fundraising in general, but anything we've we've missed here <laughs> um no i think i think that's pretty much it i'd uh, sure. like to maybe just to um flesh out what's most important to me out of everything that we've spoken here about is is the last point so building relationships um and that cannot be overstated um so going back to the previous point what i said about linkedin presence that's great i think you know the the world we live in right now that is mostly digital and social media based, it's, it's inevitable. Um, and I think if you do not have, you know, a great online presence for your business, you are putting yourself at a disadvantage because others do. And, you know, that, that should be a clean and neat website, uh, you know, LinkedIn page that follows in the same branding pitch deck should be done in the same branding. It's it's those small, again, small stuff that stacks up and adds up and, and really can, you know, like be a factor later on. All right. Last question. If we're, if we're mm-hmm. kind of leaving the takeaway or, or the big, you know, favorite piece of advice is start building relationships with investors. And, and someone says, well, I, I don't know any investors. I don't, I don't know how to do that. What is the two, two steps they can take today to yeah. start to do that like yeah uh definitely to put yourself out there and there's 
there's plenty events, uh, you know, happening in, in, in the major cities and startup hubs. Um, so to attend industry events, uh, if you cannot travel to a major city club, there's plenty online ones as well. Um, attend those, so pitch nights, uh, tech meetups. There's a number of big um, Slack channels for founders as well and for investors. Um, Twitter, Twitter is huge. I haven't tapped into Twitter yet, but but I've heard really good things. Um, and LinkedIn. Yeah. Yeah. You and I are both pretty active on LinkedIn. I'm not very active on Twitter either. What's yeah. got a favorite Slack channel that people should check out? Anyone, anything like top of mind? Uh, there's Tech Nation, I think. However, I think that might be only UK based. Mm -hmm. A global one that I can think of is called Gen Z VCs. <laughs> um, and it's not just limited to Gen Z. I've seen people who are there. I'm a millennial myself. So yeah, I'm on it. So there's definitely people of all sorts of, you know, um, ages on there. Cool. Awesome. All right. This is super great. If people want to learn more about True Altitude, it's simply truealtitude.com, right? Any, right? any any other ways people should follow you or connect with you or whatever? Anything else you want to like plug? Um, yeah. So with, to, to connect with me, I think uh, LinkedIn, that's my main uh, medium of, you know, where I put the content out there and so on. One day I will try and put it all together in a PDF, all the posts that I've been pushing out, because this will be basically a Bible on fundraising. Um, but yeah, I'm trying to put a lot of content out there to help early stage founders, you know, um, learn and understand everything that I'm doing. So yeah, LinkedIn is the best way to connect with me. Awesome. And obviously check the show notes for how to spell Ava's name. Yeah. <laughs> took me a, took me a try or two to get it, but I think I got it. Um, do you find that LinkedIn? I mean, yeah, you get people commenting and sharing. Does it lead to clients or new investor relationships, or is it just sort of awareness building? Like it does, it really does. One of my best posts uh, that I've had it generated about 140 connection requests that I was, you know, going through and it was all founders and investors. So that was oh, fantastic. That's great. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you so much. This is great. Um, uh, check out True Altitude if you want. Follow Ava on, on LinkedIn. And uh, this is fun. Have a good rest yeah. of your evening. I know it's late there in London. So I'll let you know. Thanks, Nadia. <laughs> all good. You too. Thank you. Okay. Over now. Bye. Bye-bye.